As I'm writing this video, flaps have just been put on SN8, and SpaceX is looking closer than ever to its first orbital flight for Starship. At first glance, it looks like it's poised to be a blockbuster, but in this video I'm going to focus on the business side of Starship, and why it might not be as successful as you might first think. Wait, what? Yeah, I know. With the numbers Elon is dropping, Starship looks like it's the best thing to happen since sliced bread. But really, assuming Starship manages to deliver 100 tons to low Earth orbit at a cost even 10 to 50 times worse than his aspirational 2 million figure, it will still transform the launch industry. But will that be enough? Any discussions about the viability of Starship as a money-making platform for SpaceX has to start with the general state of today's space economy. Space economy can be split up into four general segments. Government contracts, this includes stuff like the HLS award. Starlink, Earth mapping, and GPS would fall into space services. Anything made in space, but used on Earth. The space supplier industry is made up of all the companies that produce components for use in space, like antennas, life support, and satellites. The last category is the space service user support industry. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's all the stuff you need to use space products, like satellite dishes, GPS hardware, and satellite phones. The Space and Technology Policy Institute puts the value of the space industry at about $166 billion. And this is pretty conservative compared to other valuations, which are closer to $300 billion. This is because they only consider products directly related to the space field, while other calculations would consider companies like Uber as a space industry because of its reliance on GPS, which I personally don't think is what people think of when they talk about the space economy. The area which really concerns this video is the space supplier industry and the government sector, because they are the two segments which drive the majority of the launches. In 2020, Falcon 9 launched 16 missions, of which 6 were military and government missions, and 10 were Starlink launches. None so far have been communication satellites, which in previous years were a large driver of launch sales. And Falcon 9 has only been used for national security missions since 2017, when with the launch of NROL-76, it broke ULA's 11-year monopoly on the national security launch market. But most importantly, this first military launch came 7 years after the first launch of the Falcon 9, and the first manned launch, Demo-2, came an entire decade after the launch of the first Falcon 9. And it is, isn't even such a radical rocket. Sure, it's cheaper and reusable, but isn't nearly as revolutionary as Starship, which is being built and blown up in a field as we speak. Starship is such a break from the normal way to build a rocket that it might take a while for the notoriously cautious space industry to accept Starship. A sign of this is the fact that nobody except for Yusaku Miyazawa's Dear Moon has officially contracted a launch with Starship. This is in stark contrast with more conventional rockets like Vulcan, which has 33 contracted flights and a National Security Space Launch Award under its belt. And New Glenn is no slouch either. With five customers currently contracted and OneWeb and Telstar both signed on for multiple launches. This is despite Starship being arguably more advanced in development than its competitors, with two full-size flight articles being flown especially with the BE-4 engine seeing setbacks with its turbo pump, or the mini engine that pumps fuel into the combustion chamber, which has delayed the Vulcan a full year. In my opinion, this is largely because its competitors are much more of an incremental step in rocket technology, while Starship's Raptor engine is almost three times the chamber pressure when compared to the BE-4. It also uses a much more complex fuel flow staged combustion engine cycle, and it uses 31 engines compared to the 7 engines of New Glenn. It's a completely different beast, and as such, selling military, government, and commercial customers on purchasing such an overpowered and unproven rocket for their precious payloads will be hard. Starship will need payloads specifically designed for its ridiculous capabilities, and according to a report by the Aerospace Corporation, Military satellite development takes 8 to 10 years from authorization to launch. 
This means that any purpose-built Starship payloads will likely be launched in the late 20s to 30s. Commercial demand might pick up some slack on the Starship front, but I personally think Starship's short-term future will be as a multi-mission vehicle, with multiple payloads mounted in the fairing, reducing cost further and minimizing wasted potential. You already see this happening with launch vehicles like the Ariane 5 and ULA's Vulcan rocket. And Starship will no doubt be working overtime to put the Starlink constellation into orbit. While the Falcon 9 can only put 60 satellites into orbit, Starship can put 400 into orbit at a time. This is probably the biggest business case for Starship in the short term, and it's a hell of a good one. I'm convinced Starlink is going to change the way rural internet works, and it's got tons of implications for national security. You might be able to knock out individual communication satellites, but you can't take down a mega constellation. Manned launches are another sticking point for Starship. Although it has a massive predicted crew capacity at 100, a dedicated Starship crew mission is far in the future as of now. This is because a crewed Starship would need to be able to stick the belly flop landing with incredible reliability. SpaceX hasn't reached this level of reusability with the Falcon 9 core stage yet, and the Starship landing sequence is orders of magnitude more complex. Combined with the lack of a launch escape system, a crewed Starship failure will mean a massive setback to SpaceX and one of the largest losses of life in the history of human spaceflight. So naturally, all possible precautions will be taken before lives are at risk. An option that SpaceX has for getting crew on Starship before the belly flop is worked out is transferring crew from a proven ascent and descent vehicle and then transferring them into the Starship waiting in orbit. This is the plan for the Moonship selected for Artemis's HLS program, and might also be used for the Dear Moon flyby, where a Dragon capsule ferries the crew from LEO and acts as a lifeboat and re-entry vehicle for the crew. Point-to-point -point travel is another use case of Starship that I don't see taking off for a while. Airlines are simply too safe, too convenient, and too cheap to warrant widespread use of Starship. If point-to-point -point is ever made available, its main gimmick will be as space tourism, and getting to Shanghai in three hours will almost always be a secondary benefit. If Musk wants to hit high cadence with Starship, he's going to need to have unprecedented levels of reliability, because Starships don't have the same abort modes as planes, where even engine failure is not a guaranteed loss of crew. This means more engineering precautions and hundreds of flights, something which is just not achievable in the near future. Elon Musk himself has said that Starship will fly hundreds of missions with cargo before people even get on the rocket. This will give SpaceX precious time and data to work out the kinks in the design. One thing this does, however, is put a massive source of income, orbital tourism, far down the road. So far, we've ruled out the use of Starship for national security and man payloads, at least in the first three to five years. So what will it be used for? First thing is Starlink. SpaceX wants Starlink running as fast as possible, and that just isn't done without Starship. Next is a possible role in the Artemis program. This is going to need a purpose-built moonship with landing thrusters at the top to avoid kicking up lunar regolith and no aerodynamic surfaces. Starship surprised many of us when it got chosen in the HLS contract, and although there's a possible downselect where it may be cut out, we might still see landings as part of a certification process as early as mid-2022. Though, as Robert Zubrin is quick to add, Starship is going to need a ton of refueling flights to get enough Delta V to land and come back from the moon. The final use case for Starship is the big one, Mars. Creating and supporting a Mars colony is the driving purpose behind the Starship design, and its first chance to carry out this goal will come in mid-2022, when the first launch window opens. I'm cautiously optimistic SpaceX will be able to send one or two Starships at the planet by then, but even that is going to need tons of effort. Super heavy recovery is an absolute must. You can't just throw away 31 Raptors every refueling flight. The belly flop will also need to be refined. Refueling is another must. And you need to do it all again on Mars. 
but I'm really confident that SpaceX is going to be able to make the 2024 launch window. Starship is not going to be massively profitable in the first couple years, and that's okay. Elon has said he's plans on selling Tesla shares to fund Starship colonization efforts, so he recognizes this too. The purpose of Starship isn't to become a cash cow for SpaceX, that's Starlink's job. Starship is meant to push the envelope once again and make life multi-planetary. It's an investment, not just in SpaceX's future, but humanity's. I'm Cost Plus Content, signing off.